This past weekend, all around the Twitter sphere, a certain tweet got a lot of attention. Now that tweet from Idlesloth has actually since been deleted, and it's rumored that the source wasn't necessarily as accurate as possible, but there is still some truth to the conversation that's being had. And I wanted to take today and do my best Devin, uh, Devin Nash impression for you guys and walk you guys through a couple of different things that are happening in the uh, industry within the console space and hopefully just help give you guys so much more insight into the state of the game and the state of the industry because the console wars i don't know if they'll ever go away but they are finally dying and i think that's a real big win but there's still going to be people who grieve that loss and grieve this change that is just right up you know right at our doorstep but i want to talk to you guys today about moore's first and second law i think this is something that I don't see mentioned enough, especially his the second part of the law. And we'll talk about that. Um, also, how gamers have been trained. And I think this is going to be something really interesting. Now, I then want to go and talk about the ec economics of consoles and growth. Now, this is going to go into the kind of the razor blade model, home versus handheld, and obviously price being a barrier for entry for video games and how that has shifted greatly within kind of the video game space. I also want to talk to you guys about how PC isn't mass market appeal for gaming. I'm glad it exists and this isn't to diminish PC gaming at all. However, when it comes down to mass market adoption, PC really won't be that answer to the gaming space. Kind of. We'll talk about that. Then I want to talk to you guys about cloud compute as a feature. I know a lot of people are still on the fence about cloud streaming. That is not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about offloading processing over to a server to have better game performance and you know assets and materials that there's all kinds of things with that but that does come with a cost and then why i want to uh, why it's okay to be upset that the industry is changing i want to talk to those who are the most uh, like diehard and you know impacted by all this and then i want to touch a little bit on the layoffs that have been going around the industry and how you can protect yourself and make your life a uh, better in a better situation so that's what this video is going to be about i think we should start off like i said with uh moore's first and second law moore's first law was focusing in on how uh transistors kept doubling every two years and how that was going to keep up and keep going we've seen this exponential growth like if you started video gaming when i did you've seen so many generations and leaps and bounds however as time has progressed those leaps haven't been as significant. And I think one of the biggest telltale signs of that was the PS4 to the PS5 generation. We've seen it actually more cross-generational, which is a was a better idea. Like that, that is exactly what I think needed to happen in order to help facilitate the cost. Because Moore's second law states, as the rest of the computer power to the consumer falls, the cost for producers to fulfill Moore's law follows an opposite trend. R&D, manufacturing, and test costs have increased steadily with each new generation of chips. Rising manufacturing costs are an important consideration for susta the sustaining of Moore's Law, and it's led to the formation of Moore's Second Law, also called Rock's Law. So you guys can go look up that online if you want to read more about it. But what this is saying in layman's terms is that the cost to do the thing that we've been used to while it's getting and has been getting cheaper for us, the consumer, for the producer, for PlayStation, for Microsoft, for Nintendo, like those costs aren't fixed and they don't represent, you know, like what you would think, uh, you know, like just in order to make those kind of technical jumps, that cost increases and that cost gets passed on to us as the consumer. And this is where we really get into the economics of the consoles and growth. Now, if we just go take a look at total console sales, PlayStation 2 still in the lead this many years later, had a long life to go ahead and sell this many units. PlayStation uh, supported that system for a long time. And ultimately, actually, this is one of the things that set Square Enix back. One of the things that led to the release of Final Fantasy 14 1.0. One of the things that happened because within Japan, they were so used to the PS2 era that when the 360 PS3 era came along, they hadn't yet adopted uh, the processes needed to be able to produce these games. But again, the costs have been magnified. What does this truly mean though? Because this is where when you have a model system that is 
that of let's the current we'll say the current one razor and blades what that means is you would if you if you shaved you'd buy a razor and it was generally really cheap to do so because they made it up on the blades they would sell you blades every you know month or however often you needed and you were then a recurring customer it was in a way a subscription model the same thing applies to consoles they sell you a console at a loss and then they would make this up with the sales of the games by their you know 30 percent and we saw that happen where the ps5 was able to match that of the xbox series x in price smart business move but then we saw playstation be the first to increase the game price to $70. And we've seen that pretty much outside of Nintendo become industry standard uh, with a handful of exceptions in these games. Now, what's interesting about all this is that if we look at just the home and the handheld markets themselves, we're seeing a an explosion of handheld options for people with the Rogue Ally, with the Steam Deck, with the Logitech G Cloud. These devices uh, are being able to be introduced into the market because they're not having to like justify their existence. They're not having to sell themselves at a loss in order to make things up on the back end. Maybe like Steam Deck does because they have obviously their store, Rogue Ally might to a degree, but still getting their devices out there, uh, having access to games and you know cloud streaming as an option uh, ends up becoming something very valuable and especially to gamers in terms of mass market. Now, price point is always going to be a barrier for entry when all of this is said and done. And this is because that we're all living off of budgets. We, don't, we I only have so many resources available to me. And thankfully, I, I get to have access to all the different consoles and a uh, gaming PC. Not everybody is as fortunate as me. This is something that when it comes down to access look at vr and how it continues to struggle i would love for vr to be more and i'm really impressed by playstation and their efforts to continue to support that because more mass market means that then somebody could produce a game and have more people to sell it to to bring it to the market and have that as an option what this means with consoles though is that we do see that if the console prices increase sales numbers go down if they lowered the playstation 5's price to 50 dollars, you could imagine that it could probably easily beat the P the ps2 numbers everybody could just go and purchase that and play games on a ps5 same thing with the xbox price point you know is a barrier for entry for a lot of people and thus most normal people i'm not normal i'm, I'm weird right most normal people have maybe one console or a handheld some option for gaming that they have so that's a long and short way to say that as console sales go up in price, their their ability to sell units goes down. And that is the double-edged sword. That's the problem with the Razer and Blades model. If you can't sell the Razer, you're not gonna be able to sell the Blades. And that's something that I think we've seen happen with Microsoft. But Microsoft moved and shifted their model from a Razer and Blades model to a subscription model. And we've seen their revenues skyrocket while at the same time, their you know console sales not necessarily be a need i continue to say i really appreciate that microsoft does not require that i buy an xbox to play their games but this does lead to frustration especially those who feel brand invested i get it i i mean i don't get it on a personal level but like we know that people get connected and identify with brands and they make that a part of their livelihood this is outside of gaming this is like a human thing so i understand those who really are team Xbox or team PlayStation. Uh, I just don't relate to that personally. So one of the things I see with the economics of scale here is that if we're talking about a jump to a PS6 or an Xbox Series X2, those devices from a cost perspective will have to then sell so many more units. Like it is in and of itself this uh, it, it is like a set of handcuffs. Now, I think this can be set by uh, an offset by cloud computing and cloud streaming, namely as we see a shift to that market. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. PC gaming, though, as somebody who really enjoys gaming and PC gaming does a, a lot for me and I'm very pro PC gaming, it's not mass market enough, right? Like if we're sitting here saying that $500 is too much for somebody to jump into the gaming space saying 3500 or 4000 or you know 2500 like that in and of itself is absurd how that 
uh, that bridge is gapped is that a PC can do more than just play video games. You also have other issues and stuff like that. Like if you don't want to troubleshoot, if you just want to boot up your game and play it, that's going to be something that PC could have some issues with. If anybody's ever run into driver issues and other other issues with their computer, it can be a very frustrating thing to deal with when gaming. I'm glad it exists and PC gaming will continue to exist in a high fidelity approach, but it's not going to be the be all end all. It's not the solution. It's not the one console future that some people believe it to be. It does have a lot of advantages and strengths. And as you see people shift from console into PC gaming, they end up basically becoming, you know, that becomes their home, their their main gaming device. And this is then being supported by cloud streaming and all, you know, the options like GeForce Now. GeForce Now in and of itself should be the biggest, like, you know, laser light show in the sky talking about the potential for video games because it can offset that cost it can deliver a higher quality product to the end user at a cheaper and a much more entry and affordable price. And that's where you're seeing the Razer and Blade model go away, shifting into a subscription-based model. Cloud compute though, I think is going to be a needed feature, especially as it relates to new consoles somewhere down the road, namely because packing in more power, more features, into a localized console from a price perspective you're going like the the economics of it are so challenging because of that again moore's second law how it's going to double and double you know like it's doubling for us and it's getting cheaper but for them it's getting more and more expensive and so you could end up seeing more second law taking take an effect where this could be beneficial is you won't have to pack the local machine with as much hardware and thus you can reduce the price of that machine and make it much more user-friendly and affordable, thus much more mass market. And then you can have all the off-hand processing handled at your data center. And I think this is where we'll see, and perhaps an always online console in the future, which does frustrate a lot of gamers. And that's why it's important to note that it's okay if you feel upset by these changes. I, I'm not saying that you're wrong for feeling this way. It is what it is in this regards. I'm just trying to help educate you because I don't have the power to change it. I don't think you have the power to change it. We just get social media to, you know, I guess yell and try to dunk on each other in this regard. So I just wanted to point that out that I feel for those who are diehard on their consoles. However, the console wars as admitted by Phil Spencer are over he they, they they've lost the console war and so they are leading the industry forward with new ideas and this whether this does happen in the spring or not these conversations are important to be had and they're important to share because of that very nature now before i let you go if you're still here by the way thank you so much this is a secret call out we'll do, again devin nash style here um, be sure to hit that like button. Subscribe if you guys like my approach to content. I'm a software developer. I'm a gamer. I'm a cartoonist. I'm a stand-up comic. I got six kids. I love video games and I love just making videos and content for you. So hope you guys enjoy the content in and of itself. But yeah, secret call out, sound off in the uh, in the description with Hootie Who. I like that one. I always like seeing the Hootie Who's show up in the comments. That way I know you made it to this part of the video. Uh, video game layoffs this year suck. And, but I say that, and I'm not saying that I'm sitting here like individually impacted by it because I don't know anybody who got laid off in all these different mass layoffs, but more layoffs will happen. We can blame capitalism. We can blame greed. We can, we can put labels and we can use all this. And I don't necessarily think that's the most productive use of our time when it, when it's all said and done. What I find to be the most useful aspect of time is for you to protect yourself. And this isn't an ad. This is just me telling you that there's a lot of forces that are like marketing to you to make you miserable. And it's easy to get sucked up into those lies. Here's the truth. You will get laid off in your career. You will. You'll find yourself without jo a job. The best way to handle this is actually focus and make a budget for yourself. It sucks. I hate budgeting. We do it anyway. And it's time and time again. It's like going to the gym. 
A budget isn't limiting yourself. It is freeing yourself. You are becoming in charge of your money. You're telling it where to go. Otherwise, it's just going to go wherever the hell it wants. And you're going to wake up and you'll be like, where did all my money go? And at some point, all of this usually coalesces into a perfect storm where you get laid off and you don't have any money. So I would just like to say, like, while we should say like, yeah, it sucks. These companies are laying people off. Companies aren't our friends. They're not human beings. They're companies. They're, their whole sole purpose is to produce profit, to make a product and make money on that product. Anybody who says that they have a higher purpose is lying to you. It's not that individuals within the company can't have a higher purpose. Human beings have the capacity for great compassion and care, but a corporation doesn't. Same thing with a government. Like the government can't love you. Now, the government has certain functions that it can and do and does really well and has certain things it sucks at. And then we all debate all of that all the time. But when it's all said and done, you can change your life. And if you're living, especially paycheck to paycheck or debt to debt, I would personally point you over to Dave Ramsey. He helped me pay off over $100,000. Uh, using his principles, we got out of debt. And when things and when jobs got lost and things got crazy, it's you still sleep really good at night knowing that you're going to be okay the next day. You don't have anybody coming for the bills. And I grew up in that situation. I, I grew up where we had to get in the car because the repo guy was coming to, to repossess him. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. Uh, not It's not, you know, not fun, but I know people are going through it. And I think it's a lot that we lull ourselves into this false sense of security. And so when it comes to layoffs, man, it sucks for all those who were impacted. I don't know them individually, so I don't feel, you know, any like strong feelings like I would if like you, my friend, were like, you know, telling me that you get laid off. I'm like, ah, that sucks. They suck. But it's like, yeah, I, it sucks. That's the that's all I can say. But the only other thing I can actually do outside of words, taking action is to try and educate people about the truth of this world and how it really works. It'd be great if it didn't work this way and it worked the, the way it does in my head, right? Maybe. <laughs> Could be worse. Honestly, you never know. We, yeah, uh, Not that all my ideas are the best, but I hope you guys got something good out of this video in and of itself. Thank you so much uh, for joining me uh, in uh, this discussion. I'm very curious about your thoughts. Are there any things that I didn't touch on enough that you'd like me to go deeper into? Or are there just general pushback to any of these ideas, right? Because consoles aren't going away. PCs aren't going away. But how we engage with them and what we play our games on, that is going to change. And I think it has to in order for the industry to continue to survive. Because even though we see record profits, the company has to think five and 10 years down the line. And if they aren't, don't give them your money because that in and of itself is such a gamble and it's not well worth the effort. Anyway, guys, for Ginger Prime, my name is Brian. Thank you so much for watching and listening today. Hopefully you enjoy the video. Hopefully I'll see you next time. But until then, take care.